Love in the Shrubbery, Gardens in Jane Austen's Life and Works by Kim Wilson. Hello, I'm Kim Wilson. I'm the author of In the Garden with Jane Austen. I'd like to start by thanking Chotten House for their invitation to speak at their wonderful virtual garden festival. Today, I'd like to tell you about Jane Austen and the types of gardens that she would have known and how her own garden experiences must have shaped the gardens she depicted in her books and how her characters experience those gardens. Jane Austen loved a garden. In this drawing by her sister Cassandra, we see her sitting outside obviously enjoying nature, much as many of her characters do. When we look at Jane's letters to Cassandra, we can see that she took a keen interest in the Austen family's plans for their flower gardens, their kitchen gardens, and other plantings. For example, when the Austens moved to Southampton in 1806, Jane wrote about the garden to Cassandra. Our garden is putting in order, she said, by a man who bears a remarkably good character and has a very fine complexion. At my own particular desire, he procures us some syringas. I could not do without a syringa for the sake of Cooper's line. We also talk of a laburnum. The border under the terrace wall is clearing away to receive currants and gooseberry bushes, and a spot is found very proper for raspberries. The poet she was talking about was William Cooper, one of her favorite poets. In his poem, The Task, which praises laburnum and mock orange, which he calls syringa, though now we use syringa more commonly to refer to lilacs, um, we know Jane loved this poem because she was prepared to plant plants in her garden um, just in praise of this poem. So we know that Jane Austen not only wanted to plant useful edible plants in her garden, but also ones that made her think of her favorite poetry, which is a sensibility reminiscent of Fanny Price's, I think, in Mansfield Park. Over the course of her life, Jane would have experienced many sorts of gardens, from her family's country gardens at Steventon, the Steventon Rectory and the current site where it, is, it was pulled down um, in Steventon, the village she was born in, and at Chawton, where she lived the last years of her life, to city gardens, such as those the Austins had in Bath and Southampton, to the grander sorts of gardens owned by the richer family members and neighbors and which inspired the mansions and great estates in her novels. For example, Jane's brother Edward owned the two great estates of Chawton in Hampshire. This is Chawton House, uh, circa 1920, and Godmersham in Kent. And one of Mrs. Austen's cousins owned the estates of Adelstra and Stoneley Abbey, all of which Jane was very familiar with. It is guessed that she may even have visited the great estates of Chatsworth as a tourist. Chatsworth, which many people assume to be the inspiration for Pemberley, Mr. Darcy's magnificent estate in Pride and Prejudice, is the home of the Duke and Duchess of Devonshire. Although I know for many of us Colin Firth fans, Lime Hall will always be Pemberley. Gardens played important roles in all six of Jane Austen's novels. For nearly every house mentioned in the novels, Austen also mentions its garden. We have fussy Mr. Rushworth's old-fashioned garden and park in Mansfield Park, which he wants to improve to the modern fashion. The awful Reverend Collins's parsonage garden in Pride and Prejudice, and the arrogant General Tilney's acres and acres of kitchen garden in Northanger Abbey. For some of Jane Austen's characters, though, gardens are more than a source of food or flowers. They are places of refuge and spiritual refreshment. Many of the important scenes in the novels take place outdoors. Austen's heroines find privacy and solace, even love, in the garden. Elizabeth Bennet walks in the groves of Rosings to ponder Darcy's letter. Emma soothes her nerves with a walk in the shrubbery, and Fanny Price finds what Austen calls animation both of body and mind in the gardens of Mansfield Park. Jane Austen valued these renewing qualities of a garden herself, writing from her brother's house in Hans Place in London. The garden is quite a love. I live in the room downstairs. It is particularly pleasant from opening upon the garden. I go and refresh myself every now and then, and then come back to solitary coolness. 
Tragically, that garden no longer exists. A road came through. Uh, but this is a glimpse of the private garden square uh, in front of Henry's old house. So let's take a closer look at each of these different sorts of gardens. Uh, I hope it will give you a better understanding and an appreciation of the settings in which Austen's novels take place and the gardens where her characters walked. First, we'll look at cottage gardens. In Sense and Sensibility, Jane Austen describes the cottage the Dashwood women moved to. As a house, Barton Cottage was comfortable and compact, but as a cottage it was defective, for the building was regular, the roof was tiled, the window shutters were not painted green, nor were the walls covered with honeysuckles. In Jane Austen's England, cottage gardens came in many sizes and styles. At the lowest end of the spectrum were the gardens of the laborer's tiny cottage, like that of the poor cottagers in Emma, where the garden was devoted to raising food and pigs. This is the sort of cottage mentioned by Maria Bertram in Mansfield Park when she says, those cottages are really a disgrace as they approach Mr. Rushworth's village. It's worth pointing out though that the cottages are falling down and if they are and they're disgraceful, it's Mr. Rushworth's fault, as he owns the village and the upkeep is his responsibility. It's hard to imagine Mr. Darcy neglecting his villagers, isn't it? I think, I think Mr. Darcy's cottages on his land at Pemberley looked more like this. At the other extreme from the laborer's cottage garden were the gardens of the so-called cottages of the upper classes. This is Houghton Lodge, a cottage orne, or ornamented cottage, dating to around 1800 and possibly designed by John Nash. It's not too far from Chawton. The grounds and gardens have been restored to their late 18th century appearance and are open for tours. This sort of so-called cottage is really a type of villa, a country house for the rich, not a real worker's cottage, and it would have had an equally elegant garden. This rich person's cottage is what appears in Austen's novel Mansfield Park when Admiral Crawford buys an excessively pretty cottage at Twickenham. You can see that the Crawford's cottage would have been really an elegant house, about as far away from a laborer's cottage as you could get. And here are two Ackerman plans for a cottage orne and a Gothic cottage obviously not a place where you, you raise pigs and cabbages in the front garden. The wealthy people of Jane Austen's day had a rather romantic notion of cottage life in the country. And it's pretty funny, really. Um, they assumed that if a country house wasn't a grand manor house, it must therefore be a cottage. And they fancied that they were really getting close to nature and living the natural life whenever they lived out in the country in something less than a manor house. And I always think of Marie Antoinette playing at being a milkmaid in her little model village at Petit Trianon. Barton Cottage in Sense and Sensibility and Jane Austen's own cottage at Chawton fall somewhere in the middle. Certainly not fancy, but respectable enough for less well-off gentlewomen to live in. Jane Austen, her mother, her sister Cassandra, and their friend Martha Lloyd moved to Chawton Cottage in 1809. If you recall the description of Barton Cottage in Sense and Sensibility, it's really very similar. And indeed, the Austen women had almost the exact same income as the Dashwood women did in the novel. Today, Chawton Cottage is a museum dedicated to Jane Austen's life and works. Jane and Cassandra's brother Edward owned the house as part of his Chawton estate. Edward was a lucky man. Some of the Austens' rich, childless cousins took a fancy to him and made him their heir. He eventually inherited two large estates from them, uh, Gomersham Park in Kent and Chawton House in Hampshire. Well, in Steventon as well, but for our purposes, we'll be looking at Gomersham Park and Chawton House. So Edward was able to give his mothers and sisters a place to live. Chawton Cottage was certainly a step up from the laborer's cottage. It was set on several acres of grounds and orchards and had six bedrooms. Edward made a lot of improvements to the house and garden for his mother's and sister's benefit. There were not only flower gardens, but some practical elements such as a kitchen garden, beehives, and an orchard. 
There are notes in Edward's estate records that he had the cottage kitchen garden dug over, which probably meant digging in compost and turning it to loosen the soil as we all do in the spring, uh, or fall for that matter. We know from Jane's letters that Mrs. Austin loved to work in the garden herself and not just have their servants do it. One of her nieces said that Mrs. Austin not only did ladylike garden, gardening like tying up flowers, but she also liked to work in the vegetable gardens, including digging her own potatoes. Her niece said that she wore one of her old gowns as she did so, which I think is so fun to imagine. It's what we do, isn't it? We wear our old clothes to garden. Edward also put in a shrubbery walk that circled the property. This is not the original, but it's a nice recreation. Edward added a shrubbery to the property because shrubberies, which were walks winding through nicely planted trees, shrubs, and flowers, were considered necessary garden features for delicately nurtured ladies of the time, providing a shady place for them to walk and to take exercise. In Mansfield Park, Lady Bertram advises Mr. Rushworth to put in a shrubbery on his grounds. If I were you, she says, I would have a very pretty shrubbery. One likes to get out into a shrubbery in fine weather. Though, if you know Lady Bertram, who seems to live in what, I fear, is possibly a laudanum-induced stupor, it's hard to imagine her actually summing up, summoning up enough energy to go walking in a shrubbery. The most important feature of a shrubbery, besides the shrubs, obviously, were the gravel paths, which drained quickly and kept the feet dry. In Jane Austen's day, people thought wet feet could kill you. George III's madness, it was commonly believed at the time, had begun when he imprudently neglected to change his wet stockings. In Jane Austen's novel, Emma, Fosse Mr. Woodhouse is very concerned about whether Jane Fairfax has changed her stockings after walking in the rain. Young ladies are delicate plants, he said. Indeed, ladies, people knew, were especially delicate and could die of the least little thing, a blighted love affair or wet feet could just kill you just instantly, just like that. Jane Austen believed it too. In Sense and Sensibility, when Mary Ann Dashwood pines over the worthless Will Willoughby, she wanders not merely on the dry gravel of the shrubbery, but in the wilder, wet, grassy part of the grounds too, getting her feet wet, and she contracts an illness that nearly kills her. This would not have happened if she had had the sense to stay in the shrubbery. The garden at Jane Austen's Chawton Cottage is a beautiful interpretation of what the garden might have been like when the Austens lived there. Much of the property was sold off over the years, so it's much smaller than it used to be and the outline has changed. They've done a wonderful job with their interpretation though. Nearly all the specimens are antique varieties known in the Austens time or earlier. And I just love this. This is a Campanula, um, and it looks like geranium from the garden, wild geranium uh, overlooking the courtyard at the back of the house. So now let's look at city gardens. In 1801, Jane Austen's father retired, and he, Mrs. Austen, Jane, and Cassandra moved from their country parsonage at Steventon to Bath. I know that there's a lot of debate about whether or not Jane Austen liked living in Bath. My feeling, based on her novels and letters, is that she liked to visit, but she didn't like living there. Bath, like all towns of the time, was noisy, smoky, and dirty, and must have been a terrible contrast to the pleasant countryside around Steventon. I have wondered what compensation Jane Austen could possibly have found in Bath for the loss of the Austen's large country parsonage home, surrounded as it was by flower gardens, shady trees, and leafy country walks. Fortunately, most of the newer city houses of her time had long, narrow, walled gardens behind them, hidden from the streets. So this is number four, Sydney Place, which many of you may have been to. Um, the Austens lived here the longest, and it's directly across the street from Sydney Gardens. And here is the back garden. And you can see it's mostly gravel, but that's good because it keeps your feet dry. And um, there's not much room there, um, but there's enough to walk and to exercise. The, Aust the Austins also lived about six months at 25 Gay Street. This, by the way, is a few doors down from the Jane Austen Center if you go to Bath. 
It's now a dentist's office, but I asked nicely and they gave me a tour. And here is the back garden of 25 Gay Street, and you can see that these narrow city gardens generally weren't very big, but they were little green oases in a dirty stone city. And here's looking back at the house from out in the yard. The Austin's house at number four Sydney Place, um, they were fortunate. It was directly across the street from Sydney Gardens, which Jane Austen really liked. And this was a very pleasant green spot in the middle of the city. Jane wrote about walking in the paths in Sydney Gardens and down by the canal. And this, of course, I was really lucky. This is um, mock orange was blooming when I was there in Bath. I thought it was very Jane austen -y, And uh, so, of course, we had to use it as the cover for In the Garden with Jane Austen. So now let's look at the Great Estate and Manor House Gardens. Great Estates in Jane Austen's day were show places for the wealth and power of the British elite with beautiful parkland filled with magnificent tree-lined avenues, grottos, classically inspired temples, bridges and columns, and acres and acres of gardens, and exquisitely landscaped grounds. In Pride and Prejudice, Mr. Darcy owns the great estate of Pemberley. Jane Austen tells us that from every window there were beauties to be seen. Pemberley represents the very best of the grand English landscape garden style. And as I mentioned before, there's a lot of debate amongst us about which estate inspired Pemberley, whether it was Chatsworth or a somewhat smaller estate, such as Edward Austen's Godmersham. Jane Austen tells us that the park at Pemberley is 10 miles round, putting the estate in the same category as Chatsworth, which was nine miles in circumference, and even Blenheim Palace, which was 11 or 12 miles round. Naturally, these great estates had huge gardens, and here is a plan from 1789 of the Blenheim grounds. A guidebook of the time said that Blenheim's gardens covered 200 acres, including eight acres devoted to the kitchen gardens alone, with ornamental temples, bridges, water cascades, and flower gardens nestled in a wooded grove, and sheltered walks that they said were between clumps and groups of the most luxuriant and delicate trees of various climes, intermixed with flowers and shrubs of the utmost fragrance and beauty. Which just sounds magical. So I think we'd all like to imagine that Mr. Darcy's gardens would have rivaled those of Blenheim. One of the great estates that we know Jane Austen visited was Stoneley Abbey, which was owned by a cousin of Mrs. Austen. Here is Stoneley Abbey in one of Humphrey Repton's famous red books where he showed proposed improvements to an estate. And here's the before, and here's what he thinks it should look like afterward. And they did take a lot of his ideas, uh, although not everything that you see in this picture. I'm sure that visiting houses like Stoneley inspired Jane Austen's descriptions of many of the grand houses in her novels. Austen visited Stoneley with her mother and sister in 1806, and Mrs. Austen was very impressed. She wrote to her daughter-in-law about the estate, saying, I expected to find everything about the place very fine and all that, but I had no idea of its being so beautiful. It's the Avon River there. And here it is um, from what they now call Queen Victoria's bedroom, but I like to think of it as the breakfast room where Jane Austen sat and wrote her letters. The Abbey, with its impressive architecture and beautiful grounds, could serve as the model for many of the larger estates in Jane Austen's novels, and perhaps it did. This is Godmersham, one of Edward's estates um, from 1784. And you can see the river store very picturesquely curving in the front with the uh, picturesque animals. Um, Gomersham is located near Canterbury in Kent, and it's in private ownership now, so you can really only visit it by special arrangement and package tours. In Jane Austen's time, it possessed a large park and extensive pleasure grounds. And here we are crossing the river store that we just saw in the previous photo. 
and here are some views of the terraces and pleasure grounds at the back of the house. Here's the Lime or Linden Avenue, which was replanted after the great windstorm of 1987, where we lost pretty much everything of that, uh, the old avenue. And the old walled kitchen gardens are now beautiful flower gardens. Chotten House, the host of this wonderful virtual garden festival, is Jane Austen Brothers, um, Edward Austen Knight's second large estate. The house located at the village of Chotten is the same village as Chotten Cottage. It's an attractive Elizabethan manor house that Jane Austen referred to in her letters as the Great House. Edward and his family often stayed there for months at a time, and a great deal of visiting went on between the cottage and the Great House. Chotten House is also home to a library dedicated to the study of early women's writings. The house and gardens are open for tours, and I urge you to go as soon as our quarantine is, is uh, up. The gardens and pleasure grounds at Chotten House have been restored to look nearly the same as they did in the mid to late 18th century, complete with their own lime or linden avenue, a fernery, and a ha-ha. A ha-ha which Jane Austen mentions in Mansfield Park, is a sunken fence designed to keep livestock off the closer pleasure grounds of the house while preserving the apparently fenceless view from the house. So it fits in with that 18th century uh, English landscape sensibility. No barriers here between us and nature. Chotten House also features a wilderness walk, perhaps similar to the Bennett's wilderness in Pride and Prejudice. Lady Catherine de Bourgh calls it a prettyish kind of little wilderness, and that always made me curious. Um, we Americans tend to think of a wilderness as something like Yosemite Park or parts of Alaska, but the British of Austin's time meant something like this, a carefully planted little wood with paths that were geometric in the early 18th century, but by the mid to late 18th century were curved to look natural. An 18th century wilderness might seem tame to us, but note that the paths are grass which of course in Georgian and Regency terms is dangerous, especially if you get your feet wet. Jane Austen did not live to see one of Edward's additions. A kitchen garden, uh, a walled kitchen garden that sits at the top of the rise behind the house, though she knew that Edward had planned it. They've done some lovely gardens in there. And an herb garden, uh, which is um, it's an Elizabeth Blackwell inspired herb garden, and I know there are other presentations on that. Uh, this is dear to my heart because my region of the Jane Austen Society of North America sponsored a plaque there for the herb garden. Well, now that you've seen some of Austen's garden sites, it may give you that better appreciation of what might have been some of Jane Austen's inspirations for scenes in her novels that are set in the gardens and in the outdoors. Since Jane Austen loved gardens and nature, it's not surprising that her hero heroines and heroes do too. Looking at her characters, we notice that the good ones appreciate and love the outdoors, and the characters we love to hate do not. The characters of Mansfield Park are perfect examples of this. Fanny Price loves nature to the depths of her little soul, and like Jane Austen, is inspired by nature poetry. Mary Crawford, on the other hand, is carelessly indifferent to the beauties of nature, which should be enough to warn us about her dubious character. One thing I particularly noticed as I examined the garden scenes in the novels are scenes that I like to think of as a shrubbery of one's own for, one, uh, for you Virginia Woolf fans. As I said before, many of the important scenes in the novels take place in the garden or outdoors. And the reason for this becomes clear when we remember that life in a country house in Austen's time was the opposite of private. In addition to the family, even the smallest of genteel households generally had at least one servant. Well, some households had many. Even the Austen women, never very well off, usually had a cook, a maid, and an outdoor man uh, who also waited at table at Chawton Cottage, as do the Dashwood women in Sense and Sensibility. Remember, even Miss Bates and her mother and Emma, who are desperately poor, have a maidservant. For Jane Austen's heroines and heroes, 
The path to happiness with the spouse of their choice is never smooth. Beset by misunderstanding and misfortune, plagued by their parents and families, and overwhelmed by their emotional distress, they often find it difficult to find a quiet private place just to sit and think over their problems. Surrounded as they usually are by so many people, prying parents and servants alike, what are Jane Austen's distressed heroines and heroes to do? Why, escape to the garden, of course, to privacy and the soothing influences of nature. Nearly every one of the heroines takes refuge in the gardens and grounds of their houses at some point in the novels to gain privacy or to indulge, a word Jane Austen often uses in connection with introspective feelings, to indulge in their emotions. In Pride and Prejudice, Elizabeth and Jane Bennet often walk in the shrubbery at their estate, Longbourn, when they want to get away from their family and speak privately. And I imagine that Jane and Cassandra Austen must often have done the same in their gardens to get a moment away from Mrs. Austen. The pleasure grounds of a country estate filled with winding paths and secret nooks formed perfect settings for lovers as well. In Jane Austen's time, unmarried young women and men were not supposed to be left alone together, which rather limited their ability to do more than engage in publicly acceptable conversation and exchange tender glances. But opportunities to converse and cuddle, so scarce indoors, could be easily found in the garden under the guise of the socially acceptable walk. And I think it's safe to assume that a rake like Willoughby in Sense and Sensibility would sneak off into the shrubbery with a girl every chance he got. Jane Austen knew well how necessary to love privacy was. Jane Bennett and Bingley walk alone in the shrubbery in Pride and Prejudice when visitors arrive. Fanny Price and Edmund Bertram fall in love wandering about and sitting under trees all the summer evenings at Mansfield Park. Mr. Knightley proposes to Emma in the shrubbery and, most romantically, in Pride and Prejudice, Darcy proposes for the second successful time to Elizabeth Bennet as they walk from the Bennet's estate to the neighboring house. Indeed, most of the proposal scenes in the novels take place out of doors, understandably. Who except Mr. Collins would want to propose indoors in front of a mother like Mrs. Bennet? I'd like to end with my favorite Austin garden quote by Fanny Price in Mansfield Park. To sit in the shade on a fine day and look upon verdure is the most perfect refreshment. Thank you. And please find me on Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest and Instagram.